Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Joseph O'Jewell, professor and department head of Black Studies at the University of Illinois Chicago, author of his most recent White Man's Work, Race and Middle Class Mobility into the Progressive Era. Professor, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thanks. So what we're talking about in terms of just like broad strokes is coming out of Reconstruction. And, and I know you've written also a lot about the educational opportunities that came out of this. Um, and, and that is implicated in, in this story, too, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, deeply. But coming out of, uh, of Reconstruction, um, in particular for black people, but uh, we see this in, in you write about uh, also uh, Tejanos and Chinese as a way of, of showing this relationship between the emerging, I guess, opportunities for um, minorities at that time to enter into the middle class and how the, I guess, this nexus of, of I don't want to say economic anxiety because that's loaded these days, but this nexus of, of, of white supremacy translates into an economic anxiety or vice versa, or there's a play there. And this begins to sort of like reshape uh, the racialization, I guess, of, of, of these people. Did I, have I explained that right? It's, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough for a non-academic, I think, to, to, to fully appreciate this. But uh, w walk us through the, the broad stroke there. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, what's what's happening is, you know, we're, we're looking at what, what we like to call sort of the race class nexus. Right. This idea that, you know, in, in societies that are structured by race and, you know, that are also structured by capitalism. Right. That there is this linking of, uh, of racial identity with, with with class identity. Right. So the idea that, you know, some the way we kind of presume in, for example, sort of common discourse that, you know, working class equals white. You see the same thing happening with middle class identity, right? So middle class identity equals equals whiteness. But when that starts to shift, when that starts to change, when we sort of say that, you know, this relationship is, is, is upset by a major social political development like the Reconstruction era, like mass waves of immigration like westward expansion and the incorporation of new peoples then you know that nexus uh, has to sort of be worked out yet again right people sort of do that with different cultural and political responses and that's kind of what the book is is mapping here and how this plays out in different areas and we should say it also includes gender uh too in this way all of these things uh play uh play into that 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 development of um but let's, uh, uh, at one point you write, and, and then I want to go into the specific sort of case studies, because you do, um, you do uh, um, uh, for black folk in, um, in, in Atlanta, and then uh, for uh, uh, Tejanos in, uh, uh, in San Antonio, in the police force, and then uh, Chinese uh, American um, uh, people in uh actually in immigration services um and how they're met and what the response is and, and and what that does to sort of i guess the the narrative the i guess the how the racism changes in some way i think is probably a good way to say it but um at one point you talk about the forms of labor um uh that, that man maintaining and reproducing uh social range arrangements create the key link between race and class can you can you talk about like that element of it like the nature of at one point coming out of reconstruction black people were still sort of just like, they were doing manual labor and they were uh doing agricultural work and something changes and so what what happens in that instance mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, during uh, the Reconstruction uh, era and what happens after, right, you've got, you know, the majority of, of African-Americans are still working in agricultural labor, um, you know, because even though, <clears throat> you know, we talk about this idea of sort of the New South, right, the New South is still dependent in, in large part on agriculture, um, you know, and so urban centers kind of emerge as a way to deal with, uh, with trade, with tourism, some of the other things that um, uh, that 
sort of revitalize the, uh, the Southern economy after this. Um, but you know, you also now have this problem, so to speak, with with uh, with regards to white supremacy. That you know, black people are now free agents to you know to an the extent they can look for other kinds of uh, other kinds of jobs, right? They can uh, seek out education, which you know uh, many of them actively do. Um, and and so we should say that was part of also of Reconstruction was uh, the introduction of sort of a uh, systemic public education system in in many respects geared towards educating uh newly freedmen and their their children right right so you have this freedmen's education movement really um is what the um the historian named james anderson who, who talks about this right this freedmen's education movement that emerges um during this era that you know is certainly about expanding educational opportunities not just to include african americans but also many poor whites who didn't have i mean there was no universal public education in the south um, until uh, until Reconstruction and after, right? So that you know that possibility, that opportunity, then sort of again sort of creates this kind of, of problem for uh, uh, for white supremacy in the southern economy, right? It's like you know you don't from their standpoint you don't need educated blacks. You need people who are actually just going to do the agricultural labor that they've always done. Right. And it's like, yeah, but there's this little pesky problem of black agency and black people want to do different things. They have their own goals and dreams and aspirations. Um, and, you know, this is sort of what comes into play uh, in a city like Atlanta, where you have a number of um, public schools. You have uh, higher education that's available to, to black people through um, uh, through missionary reformers um, that I wrote about a little bit in my first book. Um, and the folks who graduate from these schools are now sort of literate with skills. They're seeking other kinds of jobs, right? Often coming up against some real barriers, but you know, they're sort of, again, disrupting this, this sort of old equation of, you know, black worker equals low wage laborer. Yeah. And, and so, so walk us through like the, the timeline that we're talking about now is closer to the last decade or two of the 19th century and then into uh, the first decade or two of the 20th century. Um, and this, uh, w give us a sense of what those jobs are. And I should say, like, what I found fascinating about this is that both, like, the idea that postal workers became sort of like a prominent uh, job for black people at that time, we still see that 200 years, well, 100 and f whatever it is, 30 or 40 years later, that um, postal work and just sort of government jobs um, become a big sort of like, uh, there's a reason why they're attacked today by people who also sort of like have a, a you know, fit on the Venn diagram of white supremacy. And, and also, I think like, you know, I, it, it, when, it's, when it's brought into this sort of like close proximity to slavery, you start to see like, Oh, uh, yeah, when the, the South says the Civil War wasn't about slavery, it was about economics, you start to see this nexus of, of, of how white supremacy and also um, uh, the, the working class, as it were, the, what the relationship is there. It starts to get more clear. But, but walk us through this. Uh, 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 postal workers. Yeah, so, uh, you know, You've already so you know one of the things that's happening is that you know black people are also now voting right so you know they are voters they have been given you know they've been took granted these kinds of, uh, of rights uh, you know through the uh, Civil War amendments. You should um, say black men at this point. Yes, exactly. Yes, black men. Right. We can't you know sort of negate the gender piece of this. Right. Um, but you have the uh, 1883 Pendleton Act or the Civil Service Reform Act, which now says, OK, well, you know, civil service jobs are not just going to be something that are the sort of spoils of whichever party. Right. There is, you know, there's an exam that you have to take. So you have to sit for an exam. The high scores will highest scorers will uh, uh, you know, be uh, given jobs. And you have this sort of system that the one that we kind of now understand with civil service jobs that, you know, there there are actually pathways for for promotion, if you want to dismiss people, there's a whole process you have to go through, um, and you know these are kind of pretty revolutionary uh, uh, things, right? But then the other sort of piece of this is that you still have a little bit of party patronage that's happening, right? And so Republicans um, in the South are actually trying to say, well, you know, what about 
you know, the, the black uh, voters who have support of the Republican Party, right, or who, who tend to vote Republican. Um, and so there is this effort um, to make these opportunities available uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to black people, Prim again, primarily to black men with the postal service. And, you know, Atlanta as a growing city, um, you know, now has need of a more, a, a bigger and more organized kind of postal service, right? And so um, black men who initially sort of began really in sort of very limited, they're, they're initially sort of supplemental carriers uh, for, the, uh, for the mail, um, gradually began to uh, uh, gain access to these jobs as, uh, as mail carriers, right? And this is a government salary, right? There are these protections in place um, through the federal government. Uh, as an employer, right? Not always respected by sort of the locals, but certainly, uh, uh, you know, that sort of becomes this new pathway for for literate uh, uh, for literate black men. And we should say also a federal. It's it's federal, yeah. right? I mean, that makes a huge difference in this context because yeah. this is not happening with like the Atlanta city government is not going to be necessarily wel as welcoming as the federal government at this point, right? Right. So if you're, you know, there are maybe a handful of blacks who work in city government, but they're in some of the lowest paid positions. So like, you know, janitors, porters, et cetera. Right. Um, you know, the postal service is seen as, you know, a way where if you, you know, if you are educated and, you know, you actually, you know, have these, these aspirations that, you know, there, there, there's a pathway going forward to, uh, for you. Right. There's a similar kind of thing that opens up for black women in teaching. Um, in the city, but that's sort of a whole other kind of story about, you know, you see some of the kind of disenfranchisement and lower pay and other kinds of conditions uh, that happen there. But, yeah, and and like, like on the scale of jobs, like the for a postal worker, particularly at that time, I mean, this is like a, this is a well-paying job. It has security. It's like, it's a growth industry, I guess. And it involves like opportunity to become like, a, a, you know, manager or like, i mean right there's like there's 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 opportunity theoretically to to move forward so this is a big step upwards and 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 how does how uh, tell us about the like the the blowback or the the pushback to this mm. yeah so um you know initially uh you know again sort of black men are still working as these supplemental carriers and and what's interesting is that um, they uh, initially began to make inroads as clerks, um, postal clerks, which um, you know carries a little bit more, uh, a little bit more prestige, right? A little, slightly, slightly higher pay. Certainly not paid at the same rate as uh, uh, as their white coworkers, um, but they begin to sort of make inroads as uh, as clerks, and that is seen as, oh no, we can't have this, right? The idea that um, uh, that black men working as uh, uh, as postal clerks might come in contact with, say, the one or two white women who are also working uh, uh, in, in the postal services uh, as clerks behind a, behind the office, uh, uh, you know, uh, bars, right? Um, and all kinds of panic in, uh, ensues. And and I think I covered this in the in the book. There's this incident where, um, you know, this sort of long this longtime postal uh, uh, employee and and his daughter, who are both uh, white working, uh, white were working at the postal service, resign rather than having to uh, uh, deal with a uh, deal with a black coworker, right? Um, and so this creates a whole firestorm of how did this person get hired? Um, are they qualified for this? Oh, there was a white person who scored uh, uh, higher on the uh, on the exam, so that should have uh, uh, should have done away with uh, with this person being given a uh, being given a job, right? Um, so this kind of erupts as a whole a uh, uh, whole thing, and this whole specter of uh, of sexual uh, uh, predation kind of enters into the picture. This is um, with Charles C. Penny. Yes, yes, this is with the Penny case, yeah. Um, and so, you know, eventually this kind of uh, 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 this kind of dies down. But at the same time, you have black men who are starting to uh, make inroads into being uh, letter carriers, right? Or what we typically call sort of mailmen, right? But you know, being letter carriers, and this creates a whole other kind of situation where first, like, oh, they're thieving, they're stealing from the mails, they're untrustworthy, right? Um, and, uh, and initially, there's no mention of, of any kind of, of sexual danger. Later, 
that sort of gets introduced with this idea of like, oh, well, you know, if some of the rural areas have black male carriers and white women are left alone in the house while their husbands and sons are out in the field, we all know what's going to happen, right? Um, were these, but these, were these weren't necessarily novel tropes, were they? Uh, they were just ones that were sort of, I guess, like uh, uh, employed at that point or enhanced or sort of like tailored to the to the job, I guess. Right, exactly. I mean, there's a there's a sociologist by the name of um, uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, <laughs> uh, Les Beck, who actually talks about this idea of middle class racisms, right, and how they revolve around these ideas of, uh, you know, uh, being swamped by outsiders, or you know, they're untrustworthy, or these processes are unfair that allow them to get access to certain kinds of of jobs. And so, what happens is, you know, in, in every sort of instance, uh, you have these sort of old racial tropes that are refit for a new period or a new era. Right. And so we know during the Reconstruction era, you get this the, the creation of this idea of the uh, uh, of the black beast rapist. Right. That, that all black men are, are, are sexual predators out for out for white women. And it's interesting. Or one of the things I found interesting about this is how this particular trope was sort of adapted to essentially a white collar workplace. Right. And that's kind of what you see happening in all of these cases where these old tropes are now sort of refit to say, oh, we can't have these people in this place because. Right. And you sort of draw up on these older, older tropes and refit them for, for a new setting. And how, how, how much of like, is there a way to measure the sort of like, um, a, a way to measure how much of this was a function of like a, 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 a an economic sort of impetus versus like a, just a social impetus. I mean, uh, how, how do you, disentangle that or do we not do that and we know that it's just sort of like self-reinforcing hmm. that's a good question i think you have to sort of look at all of the different pieces that are kind of woven together here right so the economic piece of this is that you know during this period there's a lot of i mean much like today right people in the middle class are concerned about downward mobility right so this idea of middle class precarity is certainly real and you know during the uh, what we now call so the progressive, I mean the Gilded Age and moving into the progressive era, there was still a lot of anxiety that middle class people had about like you know is my job safe? Um, you know I'm no longer sort of able to work for myself. I now have to work for somebody else. I don't have that same kind of control. And you're looking at a number of financial panics and uh, labor strikes. So there's an economic anxiety that is present, right? Um, but there's also sort of this kind of new political moment where people are saying you know part of the reason that the nation is in trouble is you know look at all we've look at all the money and time and energy we've spent on reconstruction only to and again create this sort of myth of how reconstruction was a complete failure uh because uh state governments were left to uh, be run by incompetent black people um and uh and white carpetbaggers uh, who are just profiteers right um and so this particular moment of, of where you have politicians and journalists and, and everyday people who are now sort of, you know, linking these things together, right? And this idea that, you know, what the, the, the real problem here, right, is that, you know, certain undeserving people are now getting access to things that should by right belong to white people and specifically white men. It, it, uh, it, it, it reminds me of um, the, uh, the bone and the sinew of the land of that book. We interviewed, I cannot remember the author, uh, but it was about the Northwest Territories at that time, Ohio. There's about 10,000 um, uh, free uh, black farmers. And um, the, there had to be an adjustment on the critique of black people because they were succeeding. <laughs> And it, when they were not succeeding, that was why we can't give them a land. And then when they were succeeding, that's why we can't give them land. Um, and there's that sort of quality where we have to adjust the critique, you know, not an opportunity to be corrupt as a slave or as a, um, as a, um, you know, a farm worker, because, I guess maybe that would involve like, uh, you know, putting a party of crop on the side and, and selling it to the, but, uh, 
once you build in this notion of corruption when they're in a position to be to do theoretically corrupt things and uh that that follows it all right let's let's go to um uh your your case study of tejano police uh, men in san antonio how does that differ from uh from the 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 case of of black people in um in atlanta mm. Well, I think the first thing you have to, you know, sort of keep in mind, one of the things I always try to do with this work is say, you know, we have to understand that, you know, people are racialized differently, right? And so how this sort of plays out in different, uh, in different time periods and certainly in different parts of the country, sort of the regional aspect are, are, are both important. Um, and so um, what was interesting for me about sort of coming across the, and I should say that all of this was sort of part of this larger project I had in mind where I was going to say, oh, I'm going to look at labor, let me look at education, let me sort of pull all these pieces together. And as I started writing about labor, I was like, wow, okay, there's there's enough here for the book just, you know, on on the on basis of the labor cases. Um, and then sort of looking at what happens with, uh, with Tejanos is that sort of move from between this kind of blurred, what we call sort of a blurred racial boundary, right, where the distinctions at one point matter a little bit, but then they don't, and then they do. And so it's kind of this blurring and brightening of racial boundaries that happens over time. Um, and so even though you have the sort of long presence of, uh, of Tejano men working in uh, as lawmen or, or, or in law enforcement, um, you also have sort of this undercurrent of this idea that, well, you know, Mexicans are not white people. Right, and so they are a troublesome group. They have these qualities that, you know, of course, were uh, were magnified uh, uh, by uh, uh, by those who wanted to justify the war with uh, justify the war with Mexico, but were you know less apt to want to give um, Mexican uh, 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 former citizens of uh, of Mexico, former citizens of, of the Republic of Texas, who, who were Tejano, uh, who wanted to give them those same kinds of those same kinds of equal rights. Um, so what happens in that case is, uh, you know, as the city grows um, and you have this presence of, of Tejano lawmen already sort of in place that, you know, they start to make inroads. They're still a minority. They're still a numerical minority, but they start to make inroads into the, in, into the police force. Um, and what's interesting initially is that, you know, they are not really talked about as being racially distinct, right? They are in many cases engaging in some of the same behaviors that um, they would expect of sort of the Anglo uh, uh, police officers, right? They're rounding up suspects of all races. There's you know, a lot of stuff that talks about how they helped uh, 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 apprehend uh, black criminals, right? So as this kind of like distinction, it's like, okay, well, who's rounding up black criminals? Okay, so it's Anglos and, uh, and Tejanos. But looking at sort of the family histories of some of those, uh, uh, some of those policemen, it's like, you know, their fathers had been, um, there was another sort of job that a lot of Tejano men did before the railroads took over, and that was working as cartmen who were like uh, uh, transporting goods between uh, between the coast and the interior, right? Um, and so all dry goods merchants depended upon these cartmen to sort of bring things back and forth, right? But you have some towns where just like, oh, they're thieves, they're stealing crops, they're doing all these other things, and you have this kind of attack on uh, Cartman in the 1850s, like just really like, you know, a couple of years before the start of the outbreak of the Civil War. Um, and that the, the Civil War and Reconstruction seemed to kind of change things a little bit. Because what happens afterwards is as you have these calls in a place like San Antonio and, 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 and in places in Texas for, you know, this idea of Reconstruction and re reinstituting a, you know, or the end of Reconstruction, instituting a white man's government, right? you have some Tejanos that actually subscribe to that, who actually participate in that, right? And some of them actually end up being police officers, right? And so they're working on the police force as San Antonio grows and expands, but you have this growing idea that there's a quote unquote Mexican crime problem in San Antonio. Um, and so <laughs> they are in this kind of weird position where it's like, yeah, they're doing the policing, they're sort of rounding up all these suspects, but you know, they're basically sort of treated as, uh, uh, roughly treated as uh, uh, as white men, right, uh, uh, during this uh, you know, during this period. But that changes over time. And then it's constructed, right, that they don't possess the the kind of moral moral 
uh, inherent morality to to be on the same level as white people. And um, forgive me if I missed some of this when I was having my my coughing fit earlier. But, um, you know, it reminds me a little bit of how at the turn of the century going into the 20th century, drug criminalization starts to come around. And in many ways, a lot of the legislation is when is tied to the uh, immorality of the groups that use certain drugs. Like you see in the South, <clears throat> cocaine being tied to, well, um, black workers are going to be able to take this and work all night and then they'll also uh rape your women right or um in in texas and in uh, the southwest of the united states marijuana begins to be a part of that as well opium tied to the criminality of chinese workers in california and it begins to be this kind of criminalization effort towards people and uh towards the class mobility of folks deemed to be morally inferior to, to white people. And I'm wondering how that played into some of what you research for your book. Hmm. That's such a good, that's such a good point. You know, I, I had often thought as I was, you know, sort of doing this research and just, you know, coming across <laughs> this idea of how crime gets sort of read into social mobility for some people, right? That those things are just sort of, and, and it reminded me very much of, of Khalil Gibran uh, Muhammad's uh, book, The Condemnation of Blackness, where he talks about how, you know, at the turn of the century, there's now sort of this focus on crime statistics and, you know, who are the criminals? And some people sort of disappear from that and others are really sort of highlighted. And what we see is that people of color, um, um, and, 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 and to some extent, you still have some, uh, some groups of European immigrants, but for the most part, it's like you have people of color who are sort of linked and identified with, with crime. And so you have this kind of Mexican crime discourse um, that emerges in uh, uh, in San Antonio. Um, during the time I was writing, it, it, the problem seemed to be primarily with the idea of, of, of Mexican drunkenness. So uh, mm. the idea that you know all the saloons and taverns were located on the west side of, of the city, which is also sort of uh, near where you have sort of a large settlement of uh, uh, people of Mexican origin. Um, and so there were always sort of this equation that, you know, okay, you know, the Mexican side of town is sort of the dangerous uh, uh, side of town. But it sort of became this effort to, oh, you know, folks come in and, you know, on, on the weekend and they get drunk and they, you know, engage in all kinds of behavior and they're fighting and they're gambling and they're doing all of these things, right? And this was seen, you know, somehow sort of linked as part of the sort of the Mexican problem uh, uh, in San Antonio. So at that point, there wasn't quite the mention of, uh, of of drugs, but it was this idea of of drunkenness and and not being able to control oneself. And again, this idea that you know, who's who's civilized, who who has the the capability of self control? Yeah, it, right. It's interesting because and and if if I understand the way this works, and uh, you write about a um, a guy named Jacobo Coy who um, had a shooting in in a in a saloon which again sort of like provides sort of like the narrative flavor for what wants to be constructed or what you know some want to construct at that time but i mean if we have a white police officer who's found to be dirty you know taking money from whatever it is no one says there's a problem with the white police on the force uh, but at that time, you know, they'll use an incident to create the divide between Tejanos and white officers that weren't necessarily there, uh, you know, prior. And it is, it's really just like a question of opportunism, right? I mean, like we see this, I mean, this is what I find fascinating about this, you know, being able to look back on it in a historical, we see this dynamic all the time today. <laughs> Um, I mean, we, we probably have seen it uh, throughout, but this opportunism in which to, you know, sort of like cleave off and define like, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, some racial aspect becomes a, the determinative, be, it, we begin to sort of like generalize based upon one incident that takes place, whether it's like, a crime rate in a specific city at any given time, or, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, 
cell phone video of uh, a black guy, um, you know, I don't know, uh, running through a Walgreen, taking something. Uh, and then all of a sudden it becomes sort of uh, the idea of somebody taking something from Walgreens becomes completely racialized uh, on some level. Talk about how was it uh, uh, talk about it in the context of, uh, well, how did the response, I should say, once the the project to Mexicanize, I guess, the Tejano policemen in a way that they hadn't been before or to sort of like other racialize them, what what was the next step? Um, I mean, in in post reconstruction for black people, it was in some instances just like progroms almost. Um, mm. And but what was and sort of I guess a resurgence of the KKK, and you saw more institutional responses, whether it was like disenfranchising from voting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What was it in this instance in San Antonio? Was it just sort of like building of racial resentments? Did we see a change in hiring? What what happened there? Mm. Well, there was interesting because what you see happen, of course, are these stories that appear in the uh, you know in the newspapers about how oh you know there's corruption uh, uh, on the uh, on the police force, right? And so they'll single out you know someone with a uh, uh, with a Spanish uh, uh, surname, right? Um, and the idea that yeah, they're sort of holding folks up to and and the weird thing about uh, about Coy, who you mentioned at the beginning, Jacobo Coy, is that you know. He was lauded as a hero, right? He was a police officer who stopped this, you know, uh, or who, you know, disarmed this uh, this gunman. Um, and this is kind of a famous uh, uh, story that's been written about, uh, 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 you know, to these two sort of legendary Texas gunmen who have this sort of shootout. Um, and in all the stuff I found, it's like there was never any mention, and some of them mentioned Coy. None of them mentioned that he happened to be Tejano, which I always also found really interesting, right? But as you sort of move into sort of the late uh, uh, 19th century, um, the pro probably the biggest thing or biggest moment that begins to happen, and it's not quite sort of necessarily linked to uh, to policing, even though there is this whole discussion about how, you know, the police are corrupt, they need to be reformed, there's all this problem. But you do have this, uh, 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 this famous uh, uh, case, uh, um, you know, uh, Henry Rodriguez, where um, there's this attempt to basically deny um, Mexican uh, people of Mexican origin the right to uh, to naturalists to become citizens, right? Because it's like, oh well, they're not white, right? And there's this whole kind of argument about race and moral deficiency and incapability, whatnot. And it's interesting because the two lawyers who are sort of pushing this, you know, the, uh, this case at the uh, at the time, right, are careful to try to eke out this exception and say, well, we're going to make an exception for, um, you know, those of Castilian origin. Who fought to uh, uh, who, who fought on the side of the Republic of Texas? So there's this kind of racial escape hatch that emerges at this point, where they sort of try to kind of sidestep this, but over time, you still have these sort of stories that appear in the news and this kind of popularity of how uh, you know Mexican uh, Mexican American or Tejano police officers, you know, are perhaps more likely to be violent, less likely to be forthcoming, accused of graft um, or this other kind of immorality. And so that's kind of the thing that you, that, that you see happen. And, and even, as the, even at, as the sort of period progresses, right, you still have this minority of the police force and it's still a numerical minority um, of, uh, of Mexican origin officers. Um, but there's sort of this unofficial idea that you, know, you will never have a chief of police who is a Tejano, right? Or there are going to be certain path. There, there, there's parity to an extent, but there's certain pathways that are not going to be open. And um, and lastly, uh, you examine um, uh, Chinese immigration workers mm. in uh, San Francisco, um, and um, there is the. I mean, it never occurred to me, but if uh, the 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 hiring that you would have to do with uh, a, a big Chinese immigration uh, immigrant population, there's just not going to be that many people who speak Chinese or have had the opportunity, you know, like you would with, you know, people sort of like speaking Spanish and uh, and 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 other sort of European uh, uh, languages. So there was a lot of uh, translators. Um, 
talk about the how the the trial of Richard Williams implicated and developed like uh, these, um, I guess, the tropes and th th what ultimately led, not necessarily just in San Francisco, but broadly to uh, a limit on, uh, on the number of immigrants we would take from uh, the Chinese immigrants that we would allow in the country. Yeah, so you know, you so you have the passage of the uh, of the Chinese Exclusion Act, and you know, as you mentioned, it's like okay, well, now we need people to actually you know translate, so we can find out you know who is eligible to come into the uh, into the country under these laws and, and and who isn't, right? And yeah, you've got you know, <laughs> there's not a you don't have a bumper crop of uh, of white men who who speak Chinese, right? Um, and the ones that you do, there's this sort of suspicion. It's like, okay, well, how do they know this language? Are they sort of involved in these kind of illegal activities or what have you? Um, and so Richard Williams, uh, and, and you know, is is kind of this interesting case because he is, uh, uh, you know, he's uh, he's biracial, so he's mixed race, um, and you know, he sort of you know, his his mother's an Irish uh, his mother's an Irish immigrant, which sort of already kind of you know prejudices some people again. Right. But, right. but the fact that he is uh, of mixed race and, you know, he has worked as, as, uh, as kind of a, um, we could sort of a culture broker, right? He had organized these tours of, uh, of whites who wanted to see Chinatown and to sort of, so he, you know, he is not sort of a, 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 a real sort of like fluent or expert in, uh, uh, in, in speaking Chinese, but he knows enough, right? Um, and he's also seen as sort of very charming, very handsome, right? And so he kind of, you know, becomes, uh, you know, becomes this uh, interpreter and, and, and this assistant to uh, the person who's over what was later called sort of the Chinese Bureau. Um, but his involved, and there's this culture of graft that's already happening within the agency, right? So this isn't something that he is sort of uniquely, but he's very much kind of visible because people are aware that he has Chinese ancestry. Um, and over time, it becomes the thing that it's like, oh, well, where is he getting all of this money from, right? And you know, what's sort of happening here? And so he has a kind of visibility that some of the other folks who are involved in this kind of work as white men don't have, right? Um, but the whole scandal around uh, around his, uh, his termination, right? And even at one point sort of forcing him to admit to a group of people that, you know, they ask, you know, is it true your father is a celestial, right? Which is this term that they would use to describe Chinese uh, folks. Um, and he's sort of forced to admit yes. Um, and so as a result of this, there's this effort to say that, okay, well, no one of Chinese ancestry should be working in or even around uh, uh, the Immigration Bureau when it comes to uh, Chinese arrivals, because, you know, this idea that, you know, they're suspect, they can't be, they can't be, they can't be trusted, right? Um, and, but again, this still sets up a problem because, okay, but where, if, if we say we don't want to the Chinese answer, where are we going to find, you know, Chinese interpreters, right? Um, and so there's kind of this, uh, you know, there's a whole sort of that set of things that happen. There's a sort of back door that's eventually created. It's like, okay, well, we will hire Chinese as interpreters on a per diem basis, uh, but, you know, they're not, they don't have the protections of civil service jobs. They're what we call extra civil service. Um, so they are federal employees, but they don't have the protections against termination. They don't have the same opportunities for advancement. Um, and, you know, the whole rationale for this over, uh, you know, as it sort of plays out is their Chineseness makes them suspect. And, you know, by the time you get to the early 20th century, this, this is sort of persistent and there's this effort to at one point purge any Chinese uh, 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 interpreters from uh, from from the agency, right? Because they again they they can't be trusted. We don't know, you know, they're they're interpreting for us, but we don't know if we can trust what they're saying, right? Because you know they have divided loyalties, uh, supposedly. And, and do we see any? Is is there any legacy of that sort of like second tier civil service? I mean, you know, because uh, 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 as, as an analog to explain like the idea of. Um, you know, uh, porters or, um, uh, you know, home health, uh, people being held, taken out of, um, you know, social security, uh, you know, and then years later, for whatever reason, they're not eligible for, to unionize. And are there, do we see any legacies from that era that, that still persist today in terms of like, what was, uh, 
sort of workarounds to how do we fill these positions, but not allow the security and the ability for uh, these people to sort of like enter the middle class. You know, mm-hmm. I, do, do we see those? Any, are there any legacies of that that we see in, in today's uh, society or no? Um, you know, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think we always sort of see folks trying to sort of get around the idea of, you know, paying people a fair wage or, you know, ensuring that they have some of these kinds of these kinds of protections. Um, and I think, you know, the, the point that you make, for example, about, you know, home health care workers, for example, right, who are, you know, primarily women of color, right, primarily black women, right. And so, you know, the I, there's, you still have this sort of legacy, I think, from an earlier not quite in this period, but, you know, what sort of, you know, right. plays out during the, you know, during the Great Depression, the idea that, you know, Black women are employable mothers, and so they don't need the same kind of aid that white women do, right? And I think you still have that same kind of ethos about, you know, who's an employable mother, um, and who, you know, needs certain kinds of, uh, you know, which people need certain kinds of protections and which folks don't. Um, I think what's sort of strongest in terms of playing out about this um, really are, you know, are, are really is the, the, the way that the sort of race class nexus gets gets weaponized. Um, and, you know, I think we've certainly seen that. I mean, one of the things that I that immediately struck me as I was doing this research, it was around the time that, um, you know, Trump was announcing his, uh, uh, his, his presidency. And I think it was in 2015, you know, this whole thing about the judge who was overseeing the fraud case regarding Trump University, um, uh, uh, Gonzalo Curiel, right? Yeah. And this idea is like, you know, oh, he's biased, right? He's he's a Mexican. So, you know, we're building a wall with Mexico. So he, you know, he's obviously biased. He can't be trusted. Right. And, you know, the same thing was kind of thrown out, you know, later on about, you know, someone in his own party, Elaine Chao, right. It's like, oh, well, you know, she's got these sort of divided loyalties. Um, And just even the same way that, you know, I think, you know, folks in the Trump camp have gone after people who I think kind of really represent, visibly represent this kind of shifting demographics in the middle class. Right. So it's like, you know, poll workers, uh, you know, like Shea Moss and, and Ruby Freeman are, are, you know, likened to drug dealers, right? Um, you know, oh, you know, Letitia James, oh, she's, you know, she's corrupt and she's racist uh, uh, against white people, right? You know, because she's pursuing a case against him. So, you know, and I think even what we saw with ha- happening with Claudine Gay, you know, a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. the same kind of thing. It's like, there's this idea that, you know, this, some, you know, someone of color in this particular position is a real problem, right? But it's also, a political opportunity for for some right who can say hold this up and say is emblematic of everything that's wrong right now uh the book is white man's work race and middle class mobility into the progressive era uh joseph jewell thank you so much for your time today we'll put a link to that at majority.fm and in the podcast and youtube description thank you appreciate Thanks it so much